Enveloped in the benign haze of this moment, I feel a bit like Tom Sawyer eavesdropping at his own funeral. <laughs> it's really lovely to see you all, my students and colleagues from Carlisle, and trustees and alumni of the college, family and friends who have come so far. It's a great honor to have my three decades of work here affirmed with such fanfare. And I'm delighted to follow Sylvie Davidson as the second incumbent of this early chair. Above all, I'm deeply grateful to Anne and John Curley for their concrete sign of their love of this place. They are and have been extraordinary benefactors. But in another sense, the Curleys are also quite typical of the Dickinson students I've come to know. In this place, Learning embodies a beautiful paradox, the simultaneous discovery of being and becoming, finding who you are and how you will realize yourself in the world. John and Anne found themselves and each other here at Dickinson. Their experience honed their restless curiosity. And the challenging support of faculty awakened them to who they could become. My students now are, as always, both discovering and becoming their true selves. But as a college, we have a keener sense of our identity, our place in the wider world, than in decades past. When I began teaching in 1984, students circling my first year seminar table came from Altoona and Syracuse, Bethesda, and Bergen County. Last fall, in the same room, students from Doylestown and Harare sat beside students from Mill Valley and Ho Chi Minh City. The composition of the student body is now manifestly more global and diverse, but by some miracle, admissions has consistently discerned the core character of our students across decades, that perfect ratio of smarts and hard work to humility. Our students are fun to work with, open, human. This brings me to our second paradox. We are completely different than we were, and we are utterly the same. John and Anne Curley gave back to this place because Dickinson translated them. Translation is the marrow of teaching in a liberal arts college. The word has a rich array of meanings both essential and transformative. We faculty work with students to transmute and refine ideas, to manifest and interpret them, and in the archaic meaning of the word translate, to enrapture students with the love of learning. We do this by refusing to distinguish between the work we do as scholars and our teaching. We let students in on the magical secret that we are exploring with them. Even we geezers remember being students, too. The heady thrill of seeing your teachers take words and ideas so seriously, and the exhilaration of being taken seriously in the hard business of writing what you mean. Anne Curley beautifully described the durable process of learning to love learning. She wrote of this pleasure I could not have imagined how the support, enthusiasm, and scholarship of our professors would continue to inspire my interest in learning through the rest of my life. The last time I saw Anne and John, they were poring over first editions of Paradise Lost in our library with students as their guides. The special pleasure of teaching on this humane scale is that we faculty keep learning too. To conjure students through teaching is a creative and reciprocal process. This being and becoming is a kind of displacement, even discomfiture. The space where certainty used to reside is supplanted by discovery and self-discovery. Here's one example. When I directed the program at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, I sent 28 bleary, jet-lagged students out to little hamlets to scout in pairs. From Caister St. Edmund and Spixworth 
to Aylsham and Cromer, now I'm having fun, they reported back to the whole group. Their opening phrase became a running joke. I was standing at the corner of Hanover and High. <laughs> and I turned towards Pitt Street. <laughs> the strange was revealed to be familiar, and the old world linked to the new in startling ways. Displaced, my students came to recognize home, but they also learned to bring home the power of this insight. In Norwich, one awestruck student told me, when I get back to Carlisle, I'm going to stand in the square and ask, why are these churches here? This shock of discovery of knowing how to learn is immutable. A young alumna wrote me last week, I think of you often because the cornerstone of my business is a slide design method that I teach, where I encourage people to create strong visuals and then drop in the text. You once said to me in a Yoda-like observation right before graduation, the visual thing is strong with you. <laughs> and now I spend most of my professional career working with engineers to help them develop visuals for presentations. How did you know? <laughs> I didn't know what she would become. She made that happen. We teachers and students are knit together by the continual renewal of our shared enterprise in profound ways. In recent years, I have officiated at the wedding of two smart, sweet recent grads and eulogized the life of a vibrant young global citizen, a New Yorker who spent her junior year in Cameroon, killed in an accident at 23 while teaching in Thailand. Writing her thesis, she confided to me, I'm having trouble deciding which information belongs in footnotes and which belongs in the body of my chapter because everything seems important. And former students become valuable colleagues. The editor at Houghton who taught me how to find an agent for my Forster biography, my expatriate American friend who leapt over linguistic and cultural barriers to help me research American army hospitals in France in World War I. The curator of the Morgan Library, whose casual invitation shaped syllabi for two of my courses last term. She emailed, I have a big Charlotte Bronte exhibition coming up in the fall at the Morgan, marking the bicentenary of her birth, complete with one of her dresses and the manuscript of Jane Eyre. Come visit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Consider these unsolicited messages of magnanimity and connection from just the last month. An offer of an art gallery internship in New York City for a current student. A save the date for the wedding of a student who went from rural Pennsylvania to Norwich to South Korea to City Year in Cleveland to Harvard Law. An English major physician, the head of comprehensive cancer control at the Centers for Disease Control, offering woman-to-woman -woman advice to a senior in my Austin class on how to choose among med school offers. News of his first solo classes from a grad student at Brown feeling very lucky to teach high school in a Quaker school. Or, howdy professor, good news, I will be zipping through Carlisle next week. Any odds you and I can meet? What's your coffee order? This 2014 grad is the PR coordinator for the Detroit Symphony at 23 and a proud Detroit homeowner at 23. Or walking across the quad, bumping into a recent grad back from Japan, quite by chance in front of Stern. He's now a freelance translator, light as a dandelion gone to seed. I don't know what country I'll be living in next month, but my email address is always the same. What interesting students, what interesting people our students have become. Now more than ever, we must cleave to the promise of our commitment to global education. We need to be welcoming and we need to get out there. Anne and John's gift supported a trip to the UK this January where my scholarship led to the University of London Medical Archives and my service to Oxford 
to confer on current students' progress with them and prospects for the next class we send to Mansfield. We all need to remind ourselves, and our students and alumni, that these rich human connections will be possible only if we cherish and cultivate them. The texture of teaching in the liberal arts binds us together in perpetual discovery and community. I am so happy to be a steward of Dickinson's engagement with the world. Thank you. Uh, extraordinary uh, remarks, although I fully expected them to be that good. The uh, just uh, Platt recognizes Wendy's appointment to the John J. Curley and Ann Concer Curley chair. I will not read the entire uh, text of it. I will just note the first sentence, which is Professor Moffat exemplifies Dickinson's mission, and indeed she does. <laughs>